Hello and welcome to lecture 19 for the course ECE 252B, Computer Arithmetic. And this is the last lecture for spring quarter 2020. And it deals with chapter 22 in the textbook entitled The Cordic Algorithms. Okay, Cordic uh, algorithms are a class of algorithms that, among other things, can compute uh, trig functions, sine, cosine, uh, hyperbolic functions, hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine, and several other uh, functions. Now, one way to do function evaluation is through series expansion. And we are not going to cover that. It comes in later chapters. But that's the, the one most people are familiar with, where you write a function's a series expansion. And uh, basically, a series expansion uh, is a polynomial. And the, if you are lucky, this, uh, just a few terms in the series expansion are needed to find an accurate uh, approximation to the function value. So if uh, a series, in a series expansion, the terms do not get small very quickly, you may need a lot of terms, and th those are not suitable uh, expansions. But we do have, for many functions, fast converging series where you need maybe five to 10, a handful of terms of the series to get a fairly accurate uh, uh, evaluation of the function. Okay, now Cordic is a surprisingly simple algorithm and in many ways is comparable in com complexity to division. And it comes as a surprise to most people. It certainly came as a surprise to me when I first learned of quadratic uh, methods that you can compute sine and cosine functions in just about the same complexity, the same order of complexity as division. So let's uh, see how this can be done. These are two key ideas on which Cordic is based. In the left diagram, the red vector with the end point at 1, 0, x equal to 1, y equal to 0, is rotated by a degree, by, by, by an angle z, z degrees or z radians. If you do this, the new endpoint of the vector will be at uh, x equal cosine of z and y equal to sine of z. Okay, so if you have an efficient method for rotating a vector, start with the vector 1, 0, vector with endpoint at 1, 0, rotate it by z, by the angle z, and after rotation, the new x and y of the endpoint will be cosine of z and sine of z. So you have basically computed cosine of z and sine of z. Uh, the diagram on the right basically says if you start with a vector with its endpoint at x equal to 1 and y, some arbitrary value y, okay, and rotate it until its endpoint is on the x-axis, the amount of rotation is an angle whose tangent is equal to y. So that angle between the 
breadth vector and the x-axis has a tangent that is equal to y, it's basically y divided by 1, so it's y. Okay, again, if you have a, an efficient method for rotating a vector with endpoint at 1 and y, until its y becomes 0, okay, the new endpoint will be at 1, 0, and the amount of rotation is an angle whose inverse tangent whose tangent is equal to y. So I've computed basically the inverse tangent of y. So these two methods collectively allow me to compute cosine, sine, and inverse tangent. And through trig identities, I can compute other trig functions, such as inverse cosine, inverse sine, tangent, and so on. So these are the three key functions that I'll show you how to evaluate. Cosine, sine, and inverse tangent. The CORDEX stands for Coordinate Rotation Digital Computer. It's a computer from the 1950s that first utilized this method. Today, modern electronic calculators use this method because it's so simple. It requires very little hardware, and it's very speedy for calculator operation. In a calculator, when you, when you press a key, if the answer comes back in a fraction of a second, that's fast enough for you. You don't even notice that you know, it took a while for the answer to come. Of course, the same method may not be good enough for a high-performance uh, processor, but for calculators, it definitely more, has more than enough speed. OK, now, one key observation in Cordic is that, of course, rotation is not simple because when you write the equations for rotation, they involve sine and cosine terms. And sine and cosine are what we are trying to compute. So it's sort of silly to try to compute sine and cosine by using sine and cosine. So instead of rotating by angle z in one step, in one action, we use smaller angles alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha m at the bottom of the slide. So these smaller rotations collectively comprise rotation by z. And we choose those angles alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha m so that rotating by those angles is simple. Okay, it doesn't involve computing sine and cosine, but as I'll show you, it's a very simple uh, calculation. Okay, so I do rotations by doing uh, what sometimes are called micro rotations, smaller rotations, that collectively comprise the desired rotation z. Okay, so at top of the slide you see rotation of a vector with endpoints at xi and yi. So this is the vector. Its endpoints are at xi and yi. When I rotate it by alpha i, so I'm talking about the i-th step. Remember I mentioned that we are rotating by different alpha i's. So this is the i step when this angle of rotation is used. The new endpoint EI plus 1 ignore that this other point, okay? So rotation keeps the length of the vector fixed. So it's like drawing a, an arc of a circle. Uh, the new endpoint EI plus 1 satisfies these equations. Xi plus 1 is xi cosine of alpha i minus yi sine of alpha i. Uh, 
yi plus 1 is yi cosine of alpha i plus xi sine of alpha i. So my hope that is that these cosine and sine values are, you know, some, some known quantities so that the computation is easy. I introduce a third variable, z, keep track of the rotations. So I start with the goal of rotating by z. So z0 will be equal to z. And each time I rotate by a certain angle, I subtract that so that I know what, how much more I need to rotate. So for example, if my goal for rotation was 45 degrees, okay, so z is 45, and I rotate by 15 degrees, then I'm left with 30 more degrees of rotation. So that's the residual or remaining rotation that I need to do. So basically, I do these rotations until this residual angle becomes zero. That's when I know that I've rotated by the desired amount. OK, now this is just some uh, trick identities. Basically, 1 over tangent squared of alpha i to the power 1 half, square root of that, is basically cosine of alpha i. Okay, so you need to uh, brush up on your trick knowledge. So cosine of alpha i is 1 over square root of 1 plus tangent squared of alpha i. Okay, so I factor out co cosine of alpha i, which goes there. And then I'm left with xi from for the first term and yi tangent of alpha i from the second term. Similarly for the next equation. So now my computation is in terms of tangent of alpha i rather than both sine and cosine. And again, I'm hoping that this tangent of alpha i will be some simple known quantities, um, and that's in fact the case, as we will see in a minute. OK, now there is a sequence of what I would characterize as ingenious simplifications that lead to the eventual Cordic algorithms. The first of these is basically dropping these circle terms. And say, OK, I'm going to rotate, pretend that rotation equation is this. xi plus 1 is xi minus yi tangent of alpha i. yi plus 1 is yi plus xi tangent of alpha i. I remove these terms. So what happens when I remove these terms? Well, these terms are greater than 1. 1 plus tangent square of alpha i. Square root of that is greater than 1, so the inverse of that is less than 1. OK, let me, let me, yeah. So when I drop this term, which is less than 1, I've essentially enlarged this value. Therefore, instead of doing a true rotation, which keeps the length of the vector fixed, I'm doing what is called a pseudo rotation that takes the end of the vector here. It elongates the vector. The vector becomes longer after rotation because I ignored this term. How much longer? It will become longer by a factor 1 plus tangent square of alpha i to the power 1 half. And it turns out it's easy to prove that basically to do that rotation, I need to draw a line perpendicular to the vector and then see where it in intersects this rotated direction. That's the new input. 
So that E prime I plus 1, the modified endpoint of the vector, has an x coordinate given by this equation and a y coordinate given by this equation. Okay, now if tangent of alpha i is a simple number, let's say if it's one fourth, then this basically becomes a shift and subtract. Okay, if tangent of alpha i is one fourth, let's say, so y i should be right shifted by two bits and subtracted from x i. Similarly here, x i right shifted by two bits. So this becomes shift and add, and that's really the gist of this simplification. Okay, so how do I choose the alpha i's? We will discuss that next. So basically now my rotation equations in simplified form are given here at the top of the slide. I iterate beginning with some initial values for x, y, and z, each time finding new values for x, y, and z. And I will keep, and I will try to keep those tangent of alpha i terms simple. Uh, basically, I'll force them to be powers of two, so that each of the first two expressions will be a shift and add, or shift and subtract, and the third expression is just a simple subtract. Okay, so this pseudo rotation increases the length of the vector from ri in step i to ri plus 1 in step i plus 1, where ri plus 1 is related to ri by this equation. So with each rotation, with each of those micro rotations, the vector becomes longer and wrong, longer. Okay, after m real rotations by the angles alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha m, and these alphas can be in positive or negative directions. So in this example, you see this is alpha 1, takes us from the horizontal line to this red line. Then alpha 2 takes us from the red line to blue line. Then alpha 3 is negative, takes me to the green line. And let's say that's the end of the rotation. After m pseudo rotations, by angles alpha i, the value of x will be the same except that it has been expanded by a factor k. The value of y will be the same for real rotation except it has been expanded by the factor k and a z has been reduced by the sum of alpha i's and we will be choosing the alpha i so that this sum is equal to z so that at the end, this will be zero. Now, if the angles of rotation are always the same, always have the same magnitude, except that we choose different directions of rotation depending on our needs, so we will always rotate by this alpha one. We will always rotate by alpha 2. We will always rotate by alpha 3. But sometimes we take this to be in the negative direction, sometimes in the positive direction. So we always rotate by the same angles. This term 
will appear in both of these rotations and all of the alpha i's will appear in this product. So each rotation expands the length by this. So all the ro ro rotations collectively expand the length by the product of these terms. Now, if alpha i is positive or negative, tangent square of alpha i is the same. Therefore, this expansion factor k will always be the same, regardless of the direction that we choose for alpha i. OK, so the next question, can we find a set of angles alpha i? so that every angle can be expressed as sum or difference of these values? And the answer is yes. So this table shows choices for alpha i, both in approximate form degrees in the middle column and in more exact form in radians in the last column. So we are going to use these approximate values for our manual calculations in trying to understand this method because they're, they're you know, smaller numbers and easier to deal with. So the angles are 45, 26.6, 14, 7.1, 3.6, and so on. I can continue beyond 0.1. Okay, so why have I chosen these angles? Well, tangent of 45 degrees is 1. Okay, or 2 to the 0. Tangent of 26.6 degrees, or more accurately, this angle, is 1 half, or 2 to the minus 1. Okay, tangent of 14 degrees is 1 fourth or 2 to the minus 2. So those tangents basically become 2 to the minus i in the i step. So 2 to the minus 0 or 1 in the zero in the first step, 2 to the minus 1, 2 to the minus 2, and so on. So the calculations for computing the new values of x and y involves taking yi, shifting it to the right, and then this di is simply the direction of rotation. Do I rotate in the, by 45 degrees in the positive direction, in which case the tangent will be uh, for 45 to the minus 0 or 1, or in the negative direction, in which case the tangent will be negative 1, so this di will be negative 1. Okay, so di is plus 1 or minus 1, depending on the direction of rotation. So in these equations, I have direction of rotation, plus 1 or minus 1, to the minus i, which is the tangent term from the previous slide, and xi and yi. And then this angle, so when I rotate by 45 degrees, I subtract 45 degrees. 45 degrees is the angle whose tangent is 0, okay? 26.6 degrees is the angle whose tangent is 2 to the minus 1, or 1 half. And I can record these angles in a table so that in the first step, I add or subtract 45. In the second step, I add or subtract 26.6, and so on. So this is just a straight subtraction or addition depending on this, the direction of rotation. And the value uh, of EI, the angle of rotation, is read out from this table, or actually the more precise values in actual computation. Okay. So here's an example. Suppose my goal is to rotate by 30 degrees. In other words, I want to compute cosine and sine of 30 degrees. I synthesize 30 degrees using these 
fixed angles that I have in the table. Say, okay, 30 is positive. So I do my first rotation in the positive direction, 45. But that overshoots the intended rotation by 15 degrees. Okay, so I do the next rotation in negative direction. But then now the rotation is too small. It's less than 30. So I take the next rotation with the positive direction and so on. And because these angles get smaller and smaller as I go down the list, I actually converge to 30. Okay, this is not a proof. I'll show you a proof in a minute. Okay, so I can synthesize any angle by using all of these angles in the list and perhaps more if I want more precision. Some of them with positive sign, some of them with negative sign. But I always use all of the angles because remember from the previous slide that only if I use all of these angles my expansion factor will be the same in every computation and therefore I can deal with it. I know ahead of time what the expansion factor will be. So basically instead of computing cosine and sine I will be computing k times cosine and k times sine but more and more on that later. Okay, so here's an example in graphical form. Uh, the, the same example, 30 degrees in graphical form. Okay, so this is the horizontal axis X. This is the intended rotation angle 30. So my residual is 30. I rotate by 45 degrees, so I subtract 45 from the residual. And now my residual becomes minus 15, negative 15. Okay, and now where the residual is positive, I rotate in the negative direction. Whenever the residual is negative, as in this second step, it's negative 15, I rotate, the next rotation will be in the positive direction. So negative 15, rotate by 26.6. Now, the rotation amount is 11.6, how much I've rotated. Sorry, sorry, this is, this is the residual. I still have to rotate by 11.6 degrees. Yeah, I rotated by 45. I rotated by 26.6 in the opposite direction. I still owe 11.6 degrees. These numbers, remember, are approximate. We are using them because we are doing manual calculation. In actual implementation, these will be much more precise numbers. Okay, now the residual is positive. So the next rotation, 14, will be in the negative direction. That leaves me with the residual negative 2.4. Residual is negative, so the next rotation will be positive, and so on. You see that the residual fluctuates. It's sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but its magnitude is going down until it gets uh, to a small value, and if this, that's the preci that precision is enough for me, so I'm actually off from the intended rotation angle by 0.1 degree. Okay, if that's enough, I can stop at this point. Otherwise, I can continue with even smaller angles of rotation. And this is graphically illustrated here. So 30 minus 45 plus 26.6 minus 14 and so on until this 30 
initial value 30 becomes zero as close to zero as we can get. So this analogy actually helps us understand what's going on with these angles and why convergence takes place to the desired rotation angle. So imagine that these are denominations that I have in bills and coins and I've added some fake denominations. There's no $3 bill but let's say we have a $3 bill. There's no 20 cent coin, there's no 3 cent coin, there's no 2 cent coin, okay? But let's assume we need them for convergence to take place. So these are the denomination. And suppose I want to pay you $12.50. So that's sort of the analog of the rotation angle. But the process we agree upon is that all these denominations have to be used. I can't skip any of them. So in order to pay you 1250, I pay you 20, the first denomination. But that's too much. I get back $10, the next denomination. Now I've paid you $10 up to this point, which is too small. So the residual basically is 1250. When I pay you $20, the residual becomes negative 750. That's why I subtract the next one. The residual becomes 250. It's positive, so the next one is chosen with positive sign, and so on. Until I get to the last denomination, and I use it with the negative sign. And the amount that I pay you is within one cent of the amount I intended to pay. Okay, why is that true? Well, convergence takes place, or is possible, as long as each denomination is no greater than the sum of all the denominations that follow it. Okay, so let me explain this. $20 is less than everything that falls is it 10 plus 5 15 18 20 21 so it's already more than 20. 10 is less than or equal to 5 plus 3 plus 2 that's already 10 11 and so on 5 is less than 3 plus 2 plus 1 3 is less than 2 plus 1 and more 2 is less than 1 plus half, plus 0.25, plus 0.20, plus 0.1, and so on. So as long as this property is satisfied, then convergence is guaranteed. And intuitively, this is because since I'm forced to choose each of these denominations, I can't skip anyone. If I wanted to pay you just one cent, let's say, okay, just one cent, I can't just go ahead and pay you a penny. The agreement is to use all of these. So I pay you $20, which is a vast overpayment. I have to be able to make up for that overpayment by basically using the other denominations with the negative in the negative direction. So that's why as long as the sum of all these values is at least equal to this value, I should be okay. Now, the domain of convergence for this particular example is from negative $42.16 to positive $42.16. Basically, $42.16 is the sum of all these denominations. I can pay you this amount by simply paying you $20, $10, all in the same direction. I can get from you this amount, 42.16, by getting a $20 bill, a $10 bill, a $5 bill. So as long as the amount that we want to exchange is in this range, we can do it with that protocol, that agreement, that we use all the denomination in one direction or the other direction. We don't skip anything. And that's exactly why I needed to add these fake 
denominations because if I did not have, let's say, uh, the 20 cent coin, okay, uh, 25 cents compared with the sum of 10 and 5, and even if these other two exist, 10 plus 5, that's 15, plus 3, 18, plus 2, 20, plus 1, 21. So all the numbers, if I did not have this 20 cent coin that I invented, I would have only 21 cents following this. So the sum of the terms following 25 cents is not greater than or equal to 25 cents. So convergence is not possible in all cases. Okay, so we can avoid those fake denominations by using a different protocol. And this protocol basically says, I'm using just the regular denomination that exists in reality, $20, $10, 5, 2, 2. But I'm going to use 2 twice in two steps, 2 dollar over. I'm going to use 10 cents, the dime, uh, in two steps, and 1 cent in four steps. Again, if I want to pay you 12.50 as before, I pay you 20, get back 10, I still owe you 250, pay you 5, get back 2, get back 2, pay you 1, and so on. So I have two steps with $2 bill. They don't have to go in the same direction, both in the same direction. They can go in different directions, but they happen to go in the same direction here. Okay, in the one cent uh, area, where you have four steps, you notice that some of them go in negative direction, some go in positive direction. Okay, so back to Cordic, these angles that I have, basically, when I go in one direction, The di term in the uh, Cordic iterations is 1. When I go in the opposite direction, the di term is negative 1. So basically, I'm encoding an angle using these, basically, micro-rotations by taking some of them in the positive direction and some in the negative direction. So this sequence of 1s and minus 1s sort of an encoding of that desired angle using these smaller angles in the same way that the amount of money would be encoded in this way. So when the denomination goes in one direction, I use one. When it goes in the opposite direction, I use minus one. So this is the an encoding of the amount $12.50 using these denominations. So given the Cordic equations, so let's remind ourselves what these are. Uh, we start with x, y, and z, x0, y0, z0 initial values. z is the angle of rotation. And then in each step, we rotate by an angle whose tangent is to the minus i. We update x and y. We update the residual rotation. So initially, the residual rotation is z0, which is the total rotation. But as I rotate by the small amount, the residual goes down, although it doesn't go down consistently. Sometimes it goes up. But basically, it converges to zero. So we make z converge to zero by choosing di, the direction of rotation, as sine of zi. So whenever zi is positive, I choose di equal to one. So basically, I try to reduce it, make it less positive or even negative. 
Whenever zi is negative, I choose di to be minus 1. Therefore, I add something to it. And then at the end of m iteration, I get starting with x, y, and z as the, my initial values. At the end of m iterations, I get x, m, y, m, and z, m. Z, m is almost zero because I made it converge to zero. Okay, and x is k times uh, the x if we if I did true rotation by z, and y is k times the value for true rotation. Okay. Now comes the interesting part. K is 1.646760258121. I can compute it with any desired uh, accuracy that I want. So this one has uh, a 12th decimal digit after the radix point. It's pretty accurate. Now, x, y are up to me to initialize. I can initialize them to anything. Z, of course, I initialize to the angle of rotation. But x and y can be anything, and I get these values depending on the initialization. If I initialize x to 1 over k, k is a constant, so 1 over k is also a constant. It's this number. Point six zero seven two five two nine three five and again I can compute this with as much accuracy as I want. So if x is one over k these two terms cancel out and similarly this x cancels out with that k and if I set initially y to zero those two terms cancel out. So I will initialize x to 1 over k, which is a known constant, and y to 0. And then these iterations at the end of m steps give me cosine of z and sine of z. Very interesting, very clever. So I can use chordic iterations, which involve basically shifts and adds, iterations of shifts and adds for x and y, uh, subtraction or add uh, for z, and then a table lookup to read out the value of the angle of rotation so that I can subtract the proper amount from z. And then after m iterations, I find the values of cosines of cosine of z, this remaining term, and sine of z. Okay, this is known as using chordic in rotation mode. I'm doing rotation. This is I, actually I'm doing pseudo rotation, but because this length expansion is taking place, but I'm canceling the length expansion by picking the appropriate value for x and zero for y, so that these two terms become zero. For k bits of precision in the results, I need k chordic iterations. So if I'm computing sine and cosine with 32 bits of precision, I need 32 bits, 32 iterations of chordic. So each iteration, remember, is two shift adds and subtracts, and one add or subtract. So basically three, you can say each iteration involves three uh, arithmetic operations of shift add, okay? Now in division and multiplication, we had k iteration, but each one involved just one 
addition or subtraction. Okay, so this you can say is three times more complex in terms of operations that we perform compared with multiplication and division. However, if we use three adders to do the three operations in parallel, the time needed for this computation is the same as multiplication or division. Okay, the domain of convergence for Cordic goes from negative 99.7 degrees to positive 99.7 degrees. Let me go back and make sure we understand why this is the case. Okay, basically the domain of convergence is when I take all of these angles So 45 plus 26.6 plus 14 plus 7.1 in the same direction or in the opposite direction, negative 45, negative 26. And those two numbers are actually what I showed you there. Those two numbers are negative 99.7 to positive 99.7. So as long as the angle of rotation Z is in that range, then the scheme works. What if the angle is outside that range? Well, fortunately, that range includes, it's larger than the range negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And using trig identities, the sine and cosine of angles outside this range can always be written as sine and cosine of angles within that range. If I need a pre-processing step, okay, to, for example, if I want uh, if I want the sine of 120 degrees, Okay, the sine of 120 is the cosine of 30. Basically, if I subtract pi over 2 or 90 degrees from it and change the sine. So I use trick identities to reduce the angle for which I do the computation to fall in this range, minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees. And then that's within the domain of convergence. Okay, you can say that this is sheer luck here, that the domain of convergence is such that it's an enough, it suffices for computing any degrees. Because when we chose those angles, we chose them to have a convenient tangent, okay? And there was no guarantee at that point that such angles will give us a convenient domain of convergence that we got here. But we did get it. OK, the second way in which we use Cordic is called the vectoring mode. So we use the same equations, except in the rotation mode, we force the z to 0. In vectoring mode, we force y to 0. How did we force z to 0? By picking this di according to sine of zi. If zi was positive, we would pick this to be 1. If it weren't so that we reduce it, if it's negative, we pick di to be negative 1 so that we increase it. Well, we can do the same thing for y. If y is positive, pick di to be negative 1. If y is negative, pick the i to be positive 1. And therefore, if it's positive, we bring it down. If it's negative, we raise it. And eventually, it will converge to 0. So when we do this, after m iteration, this is what we are going to get. And I'm not going to prove this. It's pretty easy to prove. 
the nth value of x will be k times square root of x squared plus y squared. y, we basically forced to go to 0, so it will be 0 or very close to 0 at the end. And z basically will be its initial value, the final value of z will be its initial value, plus the inverse tangent of y over x. K is again that constant. Okay, so if I'm interested in computing the inverse tangent of y, all I have to do is initialize z to 0 and x to 1. So run these iterations starting with x equal to 1 and z equal to 0. And at the end, the value of z will be equal to inverse tangent of y. So this gives you an algorithm for computing the inverse tangent function. Again, for k bits of precision in result, k coordinate iterations are needed, are needed because as we get towards the end of the iterations, the angles become very small, and these angles have tangents that are equal to the minus i. So once we get to i equal maybe 20, uh, 2 to the minus 20 is a small angle, and the inverse tangent of a small angle and tangent of a small angle is equal to the angle itself. Okay, this should be 2 to the minus i here. Okay, so basically what we are, so the, let me explain this with regard to the previous use of Cordic in rotation mode. So these angles that we are subtracting from z as we get close to the end of the iteration process, they become very small angles, okay? So these angles will be, say in the 20th step will be to the minus 20. In the 21st step, it will be to the minus 21, okay? In the 32nd step, it will be to the minus 32. The angle and its inverse tangent are the same when the angle is very small. Okay, so in the 32nd step, I'm subtracting or adding to the minus 32, and therefore that's enough for the precision of 32 bits. I don't need to go beyond that. Similarly, for the vectoring mode. Okay, so other trick functions, tangent of z can be obtained by dividing sine of z by cosine of z. So once we have computed sine and cosine, one division gives, gives us tangent. Okay, and then inverse sine and inverse cosine, I will discuss later how we compute those. Inverse tangent, we know how to do. Inverse sine and inverse cosine, we'll discuss in a few minutes. So this is a hardware implementation of Cortic for maximum speed. Basically, the first two adders do these shift and adds. So the top adder adds or subtracts x and the shifted version of y, right shifted version of y. So depending on di, if di is 1, we do subtraction. If di is negative 1, we do addition. So this is an adder subtracted. Similarly, the second adder computes this expression. Again, if di is 1, it adds in this case. If di is a negative 1, it subtracts. So we have adder subtractor, which takes y and the shifted version of x as its inputs, and then stores the result. This one stores the result back, back in x register, this one back in y register, and z Basically, again, depending on di, it adds or subtracts. So it's an adder-subtractor. 
and what it adds or subtracts from z is this value which you read from a lookup table. These are those angles 45, 26, 0.6 and so on that we have stored in this table. So it's a fairly small table. If, I, if we are doing 32-bit computations, this is a 32-entry table. Okay, now if I, if I want to implement this uh, in an electronic calculator, uh, this maximum speed is an overkill because, as I mentioned in the calculator, the difference between millisecond and a tenth of a second is not even observable to the user. So I really don't need to do things with maximum speed. I can just use one adder subtractor, one shifter, and a number of registers, and take turns, use the adder and the first step to do this computation, adder and shifter. Use the adder and shifter to do this computation. The second step, use the adder along with the table lookup to do the third. So just one adder, subtractor, and a shifter are enough. It only slows down the process by a factor of three, okay, which isn't uh, a problem in, for a calculator or even for many other applications. Factor of three slowdown to save and the amount of hardware and also uh, power consumption. Uh, may be a good idea. Okay, so that was basic cordic, sometimes also called circular cordic. I can also define hyperbolic cordic. So circular cordic is when I rotate the vector Normal rotation keeps the end point of the vector on this circle. So this vector, after rotation, becomes this vector whose end remains on the circle for normal. For pseudo-rotation, the end, as I mentioned before, goes there. Okay? Now, a similar thing can be done with the hyperbola rather than the circle. So here is a vector with its endpoint and the hyperbola. I rotate it by a certain amount and the endpoint goes there, still on the hyperbola. So this is a real hyperbolic rotation. Pseudo rotation in this case shrinks the length of the vector okay, by a certain amount. And again, if I do all the rotations, for every computation, then that shrinkage, the total shrinkage, is fixed, and I can take care of it at the end of the computation. So that rotation, and I'm not going to prove that, corresponds to putting this parameter here and assign it the value minus 1. So if mu is equal to 1, it basically disappears, and we have the regular circular cordic rotation. If mu is equal to negative 1, meaning that basically this minus becomes plus, then I have hyperbolic rotation. If mu is equal to 0, I have linear rotation. Mu equal to 0 basically means the value of x doesn't change. Okay, This term disappears. And x always remains the same throughout the computation. So that's basically this rotation, where the vector, vector's endpoint is on this line. After rotation, the vector's endpoint remains on that line. So the x value does not change. The y value changes. Okay. So the same set of equations with this extra parameter mu gives me three different rotations. Circular rotations for mu equal to 1. Linear rotations for mu equal to 0. And hyperbolic rotations for mu equal negative 1. And then these angles of rotations 
our angles whose, whose tangents are 2 to the minus i in the first version and angles although in hyperbolic uh, uh, trigonometry we, we don't call that the an angle uh, so angle in codes an angle whose hyperbolic tangent is to the minus i Okay, as I said, I'm not going to justify this. I just made you aware that cordic has two other variations. The circular cordic that we started with can also be used for the linear rotations, mu equals zero, and hyperbolic rotations, mu equals negative one. Okay, now we come to this slide that basically summarizes how you use cordic to compute various functions. In other words, if you understand this table, table in this slide, you don't really need to understand how we got to this point. This contains all the information that you need to use cordic in practice to build circuits to, to use cordic in actual systems. So the first row of the table is circular cordic. Okay, so x, y, z are inputs. Use circular cordic, and at the end of m iterations, as we obtained before, z converges to zero. X converges to this expression. Y. So this is something we already talked about. So for computing cosine and sine, set x equal to one over k so that this term cancels with k and y equal to zero. So if you do that and start with x, y, and z, the end result will be cosine of z at the top input and sine of z at the middle input and zero at the third input. If you want to compute tangent, you have to do a division sine divided by and the rule for choosing di in each iteration is that di is sine of zi this will force zi to go to zero if you choose di to be the negative sign of xi yi in other words the product of x so if both xi and yi are positive you choose di to be negative one, okay? And so on for the other three cases. So basically, if the sine of xi and yi are the same, then you choose di to be negative one. If the signs are different, you choose positive one. And this will force y to go to zero at the end of the process. So after m steps, y has become 0. The top output is this expression. And the bottom output is this expression. Again, we have already discussed this. So to compute tangent minus 1, inverse tangent, set x equal to 1, this x equal to 1, and z equal to 0. To compute inverse cosine, you use this identity. Inverse cosine of w is the inverse tangent of square root of 1 minus w squared divided by w. Okay, so you compute this expression. I'll show you how, how to actually compute that with in a simple way, but for now just assume that you have to do a squaring, you have to do a subtraction, you have to do square rooting and a divide, and then use that as an argument y for this process. You find the inverse tangent of that argument y. Inverse sine is similar. Inverse tangent of w divided by square root of 1 minus w squared. Okay, so basically the top row specifies all trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent on the left side. 
and inverse tangent, inverse cosine, and inverse sine in the right panel. When you use linear cordic, x doesn't change. So start with x, y, and z. At the end, the top output will be x. y becomes y plus xz, and z converges to 0. In this column, basically, we force z to 0. So here we have a multiply add operation. So we can use chordic iterations to do multiply add, or if we set y equal to 0 at the beginning, just a simple multiplication. So chordic hardware is capable of doing multiplication as well. I don't need to have a separate multiplier. If I have chordic hardware to compute sine and cosine and inverse tangent, I can use it also to compute product or multiply add. If I use it in vectoring mode, I force y to 0, and x, of course, doesn't change. The third output will be z plus y over x. Therefore, chordic can also be used to do divide or divide add. So again, if I initialize z to 0, I get the ratio y over x. I do division. Otherwise, I do division add, divide add. OK. Why do I say use the same hardware? Because mu, so, so let me go back to this hardware implementation. OK, so I now have a mu sitting here. If mu is equal to 1, I use the hardware as shown here. If mu is equal to negative 1, then just the role of add and subtract are reversed here. In other words, whenever originally I told this unit to add, I now tell it to subtract, and vice versa. So there should be basically a control mechanism that we tell whether we are performing the circular chordic or hyperbolic chordic. And if we are doing the linear chordic, the mu sitting here is 0. Basically, we don't add or subtract, so we force this input of the adder to 0 in that case. So put a mux here so that you can either choose 0 for this input or this shifted y as input. And when I want to do linear rotations, I choose 0 as this. So the same hardware essentially can be used to do all three versions of Cordic. Circular, linear, and then hyperbolic is the last row of this table. When I start with x, y, and z, again, z is forced to go to 0. And this one becomes k prime. k prime is the shrinkage factor. k was the expansion factor up there. k prime x hyperbolic cosine of z minus y hyperbolic sine of z, similarly for the second output. Again, if I set x to 1 over k prime, these two terms cancel out. And if I set y to 0, these terms disappear. And I will be computing hyperbolic cosine of z and hyperbolic sine of z with these iterations. Hyperbolic tangent is simply the ratio of hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. e to the power z, which is a function of interest, is simply the sum of hyperbolic sine and cosine. This is a well-known algebraic identity. e to the z is hyperbolic sine of z plus hyperbolic cosine of z. So once I've computed those two, I just add them to find e to the z. And the general exponentiation, w to the power t, so this is what e to the z exponentiation with e, the base, the general w to the power t is e to the power t times log, natural log of w. OK, uh, hold on to this for a, for a minute until we find out from the right side how to compute logarithm.
Okay, once you know how to compute logarithm, then we can do this computation. So in vectoring mode, Cordic, oops, hyperbolic Cordic, again, we start with x, y, and z, we force y to 0. We get k prime square root of x squared minus y squared at the, on the top output and z plus inverse hyperbolic tangent of y over x. Again, if you set z to 0 and x to 1, you get inverse hyperbolic tangent. So you have in hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sine, inverse hyperbolic tangent. And log of w, log is another function, natural log of interest, is 2 times inverse hyperbolic tangent of w minus 1 divided by w plus 1. So you need this pre-processing. Compute w minus 1, compute w plus 1, do division, and then compute inverse hyperbolic tangent using this scheme. And then 2 is simply a left shift. Okay, square root of w, again, this is a simple algebraic identity, easily verified. Square root of w is w, square root of w plus one-fourth square minus w minus one-fourth square. So you compute w plus one-fourth, you compute w minus one-fourth, those are basically two simple additions. You do the subtract, uh, sorry, then once you have these two terms, you need something squared minus something else squared. And that's what you can get here. So we have a mechanism to compute square root of x squared minus y squared. In this case, x is w plus 1 fourth, y is w minus 1 fourth. So basically, to compute square root of w, you have some pre-processing to do to find w plus 1 fourth and w minus 1 fourth, and then you use this hardware. Of course, you don't quite get the square root that you want. It's multiplied by this constant. So you have to basically multiply by the inverse of that constant. Now that constant, we know what it is. We know it's inverse, the constant k, and inverse of k are all known. Okay, now the kicker is that all of these things that require division like here, or multiplication such as here, they can be done with the same Cordic hardware. So basically multiple uses, multiple phases of using the same hardware leads to the evaluation of all these functions. To finish up this table, inverse hyperbolic cosine is log of, again, these are algebraic identities, log of w plus square root of 1 minus w squared. Inverse hyperbolic sine is log of w plus square root of 1 plus w squared. And then 1 minus w squared can be computed using here. Set x to 1 and y to w, and at the end adjust for this to remove this constant. 1 plus w squared can be computed here. 1 plus w squared. So everything we need, including all the intermediate calculations, can be done this using the same Cordic hardware. So this table, basically, once you understand it, is something that you can refer to in order to implement Cordic computations. There is one complication, though. In the case of circular Cordic, we were lucky in that convergence took place because of the way those angles were. Unfortunately, for hyperbolic Cordic, convergence is not guaranteed because the angles or those values that we use do not satisfy the property that ensures convergence.
The solution, however, is pretty easy. So in hyperbolic cortic, so here for 32 bits of precision, we do 32 iterations. Here we have to repeat some iterations. Iteration number four will be repeated twice. This is like in the money example, you know, we use some steps twice to ensure convergence. 13, 40, 121. So if you are doing 32 bits of precision, basically you have two extra steps. For i equal to 4, you repeat that step before going to the next step. For i equal to 13, you repeat that step. If you are doing 64 bits of precision, you also repeat the step corresponding to i equal to 40. Okay, so three extra steps. That's not a big deal. Having three extra steps added to 64. Okay, but they are needed in order to ensure correct values for the results. There are some other uh, problems too that are a bit advanced and uh, for example, using this equation for exponentiation sometimes lead to very poor error characteristics. Okay, and therefore this may not be the best way of computing w to the power of t, unless you take some precautions, and those are available in the literature how you do that. Another problem is... Uh, Okay, that comes in a later slide. I'll discuss it then. Okay, there are certain cortic speed up methods that uh, I'm going to skip because we've already spent a lot of time on this. They are not really, uh, you know, very useful in practice because cortic is already a pretty efficient in terms of hardware and fast in terms of time. So these speed up methods are really not all that interesting. Of course, cortic could have been obtained uh, using an algebraic formulation. And if you are interested in that, read section 22.6 on the textbook. We did not really have to go through all those geometric derivations and explanations. You can just write algebraic formulas and de derive the method independent of that uh, geometric interpretation. But I, uh, from you know, I myself find the geometric uh, view of cortic more enlightening and uh, easier to understand. Although the algebraic derivation is just you know one and a half pages in the textbook, is much quicker but it's not very intuitive. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I thought another slide comes. Uh, now, let me explain what, what I meant to do here. So when you use this table, remember that the domain of convergence for circular cortic is from roughly speaking, minus 90 degrees to 90 degrees. So if an angle is outside that range, you have to do something called reduction of the operands. So for example, I mentioned if the angle is 120 degrees, that's outside that range. So you have to formulate sine of, sine of z and cosine of z, where z is 120, in terms of sine of z and cosine of z, or z prime, I should say, some other angle that is does not exceed 90 degrees in magnitude. And you can use trig identities for doing that. So for you know normal angles that are not too large, that uh, doesn't lead to any problems. But imagine I want to compute sine of 1 million, okay? That makes sense, you know, an angle can be 1 million radians. So sine of 1 million, I have to reduce 1 million to a small angle between negative pi over 2 and plus pi over 2. 
and to do that I have to repeatedly subtract pi from it and now pi is not exactly representable uh, in the machine representation so if I repeatedly subtract many times that imprecise value of pi errors can add up so if I'm not careful and I try to reduce z equal 1 million to a value between minus pi over 2 and plus pi over 2, the value that I get will have a lot of error because of repeated subtraction of a number that isn't precise. Of course, it only differs from the precise value in the least significant bit, but because the process of subtraction is repeated many times, then the errors add up. So I just wanted you to be aware that there are special methods to prevent this reduction from introducing additional errors. But for normal angles that we encounter in practice, uh, and say signal processing com computations, these angles are small enough so that uh, those reduction operations do not cause uh, much difficulty. Okay. So this is the end uh, of the road for us in spring quarter. Uh, we have completed uh, up to chapter 22 in the textbook. Chapters 1 and 2 were left up to you to read. And chapters uh, 3 through 22 I covered in 19 lectures. And then uh, I've updated the slides for the rest of this section in case you're interested to look at them, uh, but not the slides for the last part of the textbook yet. I may do that too so that we have a completely up-to-date set of slides for the entire textbook. Okay, I hope you enjoyed uh, this course on computer arithmetic. There's a lot more to computer, computer arithmetic than we covered in this course. But my hope is that you basically obtain the foundation for understanding what computer arithmetic is and be able to study the literature in computer arithmetic and learn all the other interesting stuff that is still going on in the field of computer arithmetic. We have an annual conference, IEEE Symposium on Computer Arithmetic, where new results are presented every year. So it's a, it's a, a, a active research field that is still continuing, and uh, therefore, uh, to do justice to to the field, I we probably should have had two courses in computer arithmetic to be able to cover some of the more advanced stuff as well. Okay, so uh, thank you, and uh, I'll be in touch through announcements uh, about the rest of the course, uh, and uh, eventually I will report your grades after reading your uh, final research report. Uh, bye for now.